Welcome back. Let's delve more into the wonderful world of post work in Photoshop, something that sounds a little technical when I say image compositing. That's really the process of combining multiple things together to make one new thing out of it. Typically images, there could be images, image elements. We've already talked about correction layers. And in this episode, I'm gonna show you how to add a background onto a transparent render. So we've made the image that I'm showing you here of our Kermi render, and anything that's gray in the background here, that's not a color, that's just provided by my image viewer here on Windows. And we're gonna go and replace that with something else. I'm gonna show you the, all the baby steps that are necessary to make something like this out of that. Now I've deliberately overdone it here a little bit just to show you what is possible and how you can get there. You can use as much or as little of this as you want. I'm gonna deconstruct this here in a moment um, before we get started. You could just have a plain color here. In fact, I can just probably go and switch those things off here like that. Then we have flat color, but that sometimes looks a little bland and boring. We still have the regular corrections that, I've, that we've talked about before. So we apply that and that already looks nice, but I thought she could probably separate from the background a little more. So I have added something like this, and we're going to talk about how to make that happen. As, as I said, you can use as much or as little as you want of that. If you don't have that in the render, then this is something that we can, you know, have on a plain background. Or if you think, hey, I'd like some Something more extravagant I have added something like this and that is just another layer here on top of the pink so let me show you how we get to something like that from scratch I might go and save this and I'll include it with our project so that you guys can go and have a look at how I've made this here I've shown you before that I've actually made two renders out of this person here one with the uh, freckled skin shader that was very light and one with the penny skin shader that was a little bit darker and i think that might fit the image better but at the time i'm making this happen i don't really know which direction i want to go in so i thought i'm going to show you another way in photoshop of combining a couple of images uh, together so that they're already in the same document so we used to go via file open and that'll open a single image in a new Photoshop document. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go and use a little script here under here, file script, and I'm going to use this one, load files into a stack. And that'll let me pick multiple files or a whole folder that'll then get loaded into one Photoshop document. So I'm going to go ahead to browse and head over to my render folder. And I'm going to use these two, shift select both of them, hit OK and then hit OK again, and then Photoshop's gonna load both of these into the same document and each of them on a separate layer. So this is good news for me because that means I can go and switch one off and only leave the other. And if I change my mind later, then you know both of these things are already there for me to use. I think I'm gonna go with the slightly darker skin shader. So I'll left click and drag that to the top. And the layer on the bottom here, I'm gonna go and switch that off even though we barely see anything, we do see it's kind of bleeding through here. If I leave both layers enabled, I don't really want to do that. I'm going to switch the one that I'm not using off just so that we have it, but it's not visible. Now notice this little checkerboard pattern here that Photoshop provides. And this is Photoshop's way of saying, hey, there's nothing in this image right now. This is transparent here. And we have that because in iRay, I did not enable the environment dome and I rendered it out and iRay made this transparent so I can replace it with something else in Photoshop really easy. And to do that, I'm gonna go first of all, put these two guys into their own layer. So shift select both of them and then left click and drag both of these layers into a little folder icon so that we tidy things up from the very beginning. And I'm gonna call that characters here. Now they're both in one group here. Next, I'm gonna go and create a flat background here. I'm not sure what color, but I'll go and start with a flat color. I could use my flood fill tool again, or I can use one of the layer options that Photoshop has, namely, once again, that little yin yang icon here. If I click that, I can pick one of these three at the top, solid color, gradient, or pattern. So all those give nice effects. I'm gonna go and start with a solid color. 
and that'll bring me a color picker that I can now use to pick something that I would like. So I might go and pick something a bit like what we saw earlier, just something darkish gray like this here. Hit OK. And then we see, well, only a dark gray picture. And that is because Photoshop has put the color layer above our characters group. So that means this is the last thing that is shown. And that is, of course, not what I want. So I left click and drag that to the bottom of my layer stack. And now I have my characters on top of my gray background here. The good thing is this is also non-destructive. So I wanted to change that color. I can just go double click this icon here. The color picker comes up again and I can pick another color that I might think would work better. So maybe something red or I can just go and scroll through colors until I see something that I like. So it's a bit of a problem for creatives. We can never make up our minds, do we? So we can also have multiple colors so that we can you know, make that decision later. If we have three variations, you think, well, I'm going to make the final decision later where I want to go with that. I'm thinking maybe this looks nice, but I can also go and hover from the color picker over into the image and then my mouse cursor turns into a little eyedropper icon and that means I can now left click here and pick a shade from the image. So maybe I want to match something here from the shirt, maybe a darker blue, something like this. Or I want to match this blue from the reflection in the skirt here. I can totally do that. So it depends on what I'm after here and what looks nice. Or I can be totally creative and pick a different color, maybe something like an orange, like a darker orange. You don't have to make the final decision just yet because we can change that later. I might stick with something like this here. Now, right now, the background is flat, so that means there's no variation in it. This color is exactly the same as this color, and we perceive that as a little bit boring. So, like we've seen with our vignette example, if there's a little bit of variation, it really breaks the image up. And the easiest thing to make that happen is by the use of a gradient. Let me go and switch my characters off for a second and just deal with the background. There is a gradient option in Photoshop that we can apply as a layer similar to this. But what I like doing is create a new layer on top of my background layer here so that I have an empty layer like this. And then I will apply a gradient on top of this. And that allows me to blend it in as much or as little as I want on top of the background that I'm using here. Typically, I use something just like a black and white gradient. And there's a tool for that that is hiding under the paint bucket tool here. So if you long click on this, then this little menu comes up and there's the gradient tool. So I might use this and on the layer that is currently completely empty, I can now go left click and drag on the canvas to draw out a layer that is created between these two colors here. So between black and white. So as I do that, left click and drag, a line comes up. The moment I let it go, a gradient appears. So I can also, if, if the line is short like this, then the gradient is going to be very sm slim. But if the line is longer, then the gradient is, well, interpolating between these two background and foreground colors over a longer space here. Hit Control A and delete to clear the layer. Let's do that again with a longer line, like something like that. Or if you wanted to have the line go in a different direction, you can go and do something like that. Just hint at the fact that dark is typically somewhere at the bottom and light at the top. You can do it multiple times to stack up your gradient like this. And say we're happy with this, we can now go bring our lady back. And then we have something like a fairly simple gradient background here. And that's a very simple trick. There's a ton of options here at the top of Photoshop. This is with the gradient tool selected. These are other modes of how to draw the gradient. Let's stick with black and white for now and just not use the linear gradient, which is the one that I've used. Let me show you the radial gradient next. That's also a very cool one. So I'm going to go and select that. And since I don't need my characters or whatever I've done previously here, I'm going to go and control A to select everything, then hit delete to clear that layer. And let me draw up my radiant by left clicking and dragging onto here. That also draws a line, but the effect is very different. So we can use this, we can use multiple of these. And we can invert them as well. The longer the line is, the bigger that kind of magic circle in the background is here. So maybe something like that. Bring your characters back and see maybe that is something that you like. Or we can do something like this. That might also look nice. Again, you can do it multiple times if you like. 
So one of the things, experimentation really is key and depending on what you'd like for your image, there's a bit of dark now and there's a bit of color and both of these blend together with the background color that I had selected. And like before, if the black is now too strong, you can just go and drop down the opacity of that gradient layer and then we kind of just blend this in where we break up the background a bit. So those are two simple ways of making the background look a little bit more interesting than just a flat color. But you could go ahead and import your own images and then manipulate them in a particular way. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Next, let's have a look at how we can make a figure stand out a little bit better from the background. So with my gradient here, or maybe with something like a darker color, I feel that she could maybe pop out a little bit more. And she's lit okay, so I have a few highlights here around her figure, but I could emphasize that by giving her something like an interesting glow. And that's an interesting Photoshop technique I'd like to show you. First, I'm going to go and put these two layers here into their own group so that we tidy this up with shift select both of these, left click and drag into that little group icon here and call that BG for background. You can also, if you wanted to have an empty group, you can just go and click this icon. That'll create an empty group. And if ever you wanted to get rid of something, you can left click and drag that into that little trash can icon down here and then that'll disappear. So if ever you've made a mistake and there's a layer that you don't want, you can just go and drop that into the garbage bin. So Photoshop has a cool feature in that it lets you make selections. Some of them we've already talked about, like a circular one, or currently I have everything selected. That means, you know, we have technically a square selection in my case, but I can also select something that's already in the image. And there's this little tool that we can use for this. It's called the Object Selection Tool. It's a fairly recent addition to Photoshop. It's designed for stuff that if you had a person in front of a background and it's the same image, you could go and left click and drag over the person and Photoshop will try and do its best to separate the person from the background and basically mask the person off so that you can replace the background. It's a very cool technique. Thankfully, we don't. We can make it really easy on Photoshop because we already have the character separated. All we need to create is the selection. So I'm going to go and select my lady friend here and I'm going to hit Control D to deselect everything. Then I'll use this object selection tool here. And there's a few options here. We need the first one, the object selection tool. There's also the quick selection and the magic wand tool. Just in case you don't see the object selection tool, you might be looking for any of these. W is the shortcut key. If you don't see the object selection tool, you see the quick selection and the magic wand, but no object selection. It could be that you're running an older version of Photoshop. So I know this has been introduced in the last two or so years, I believe. So the current version of uh, Photoshop CC does have it. And that's the only one that you can still buy, really. So it's one of those things. So let's select this one, Object Selection Tool, then left click and drag a square all around our figure here, like so. Literally just encompass everything. And as soon as I let go, Photoshop thinks about this for a second, a little spinning wheel icon comes up, and it has made marching ants all around my figure. And if I hover over her, then she's now lit blue. So that means this is the current selection. If I switch my character off, then I can see the outline of her is still there, and that's ex kind of exactly what I want. I'm going to go and create a brand new layer here with this little plus icon, and that's the one that needs to be underneath my character's layer. So I'm just going to put that here for now. It's between the background and the character's group. It's empty. And I'm going to go and expand this selection. So what I like to do is retain the shape, but make it a little bit larger so that I can then fill this with a color, maybe blur it out, apply some funky effects on it, and therefore then separate the character from the background. So in order to do that, I can go and head over to the select menu. And then there's a modify menu here that lets me add a border, make it smoother, expand it, contract it, or feather it. So this is like, you know, thinning it out on the borders. I like to expand it, so make the whole selection larger. And when I do that, a little context menu pops up that says, hey, how many pixels would you like to enlarge the current selection outwards? And I don't know what's going to work here. I'm going to try 50 just to see if that's going to work or not. Hit OK, and then we see the shape is the same, it's just larger now. It's kind of exactly what I want. 
Let me go and fill this now with the color. Doesn't matter what color, we can change that later with an overlay if we wanted to. I'm gonna use the paint bucket tool for that. Mine isn't currently showing because I've used the gradient tool last, so I'm gonna to have to left click and hold onto that and then switch this over to the paint bucket tool, like so. And then inside the selection, I'm gonna go left click. And that, oh, that makes her black. Okay, cool. I wanted her to be white, but that's cool. We can easily switch that over with these two colors here. Another little feature I haven't quite shown you. This little arrow here will swap the background and the foreground color around. If I do that, then white becomes my foreground color. And if I do it again, black becomes my foreground color again. So with white being my foreground color, I can go and left click inside the selection to make this outline white now. Let me switch my characters on and see what's going on here. Okay, cool. We have her with a white outline. It's kind of what I want. That might be a bit much, but we can always change that later. That's okay. I'm going to hit Control D to deselect everything and turn this layer into a smart object. We've talked about that already. I'm doing this so that I can apply an effect and then change the effect retrospectively. If I were to apply the effect now without it being a smart object, it would still work, but Photoshop would essentially ruin this layer. It would burn the change in. If I were to blur this, if I put an effect on there, this layer would literally be unchangeable. But if I turn this into a smart object first, then I can go back and change the effect on that and remove it entirely and do something else with it. It's quite handy, I tell you that. Let's go and right click on that layer and choose convert to smart object. I might go and name this outline just so that I know what that is. And then I'll head over to the filter menu and show you another interesting blur effect we can use for this. Under blur, there's something like motion blur. That's an interesting one. Let's click that and we can see this effect. That is nice. We have two options here, which is the angle and the distance. The lower the distance, the less of the blurring in the direction of the angle is happening. So if I set this to something really high, then we see something like this. Quite neat. That might be a bit too much, but maybe I'm going to stick with something like, you know, 300. That might work. The angle, if I go and left click and drag this little circle here, or if I type in a number, then the angle of the motion blur is being changed. So quite exciting, the effects that you can do with that. I might just leave that on zero, but I encourage you to play around with this. While we've looked at toning this down with the opacity here, left click and drag, then the effect gets a little bit less pronounced and that already looks quite nice. There are other blending modes that we can use. So currently we're using this one here, the normal one. And that just means that it's added on top of the current layer and however much opacity we've set, this is how strong the effect is. And there are other modes of calculation. So if I click this, there's a whole host of options here. Not all of them are working well for every situation. So most of them are a little suspect to me. And uh, Photoshop has this thing that if you hover over them, it'll show you the effect that it has on the current layer. So I'll go and just um, show you this with dissolve that makes little flakes here. And then there's color burn. Many of them we don't see depending on the color of our layer that we're blending in. So the one that I'm thinking about is maybe something either like overlay or soft light. See that overlay is quite nice because it's not the white anymore that my layer was. I might go and use that and then crank up the opacity a little. And then you can see that something mysterious is happening here on the outsides of Our Lady, but it doesn't look all as harsh as the white. So this looks like a ghosting effect here. I kind of like that. So I'm going to dial this into about 70%. I might leave that there. If you think, hey, maybe I'd like for this to be a different color, you can go and overlay a color onto our outline here if you wanted to do that. That happens with blending options of, about which we haven't quite talked about, but it is something that's really helpful when it comes to adding drop shadows or changing the color or adding a pattern onto something or combining all these things. The easiest way to do that is to right click on something and every layer supports this and the success will be dependent on what type of layer you have. There's this option here at the top which is called blending options. And if you select that, a brand new menu appears in which you can now enable many of these things. So you can add a stroke that is an outline around the whole layer. So that in, in our case, that doesn't work. Color overlay means replace the current color and blend a different color in. So you have to enable the effect and then select it. And then you can select the color here and how much that color is supposed to be interpolated over that. So right now, 
I'm adding black to this, but maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to go and put, I don't know, something like a yellow to it. Let's just see what that looks like. There we go. That works. So even though my outline was originally white, now it's yellow and I can go and blend that in. Once again, I have a real time preview here of what the effect looks like. And I can also change the blend mode here once again. This is what the color looks like that's now added on top of my outline here with the blending mode. Maybe yellow wasn't great. So I'm going to go back here and maybe make that something like orange. That might work. That might work. That looks nice and psychedelic here. As if she's on drugs. This is cool. As if we're on drugs. So you can add other effects and stack them and swap them around. Like, you know, a pattern overlay is a good idea. If you wanted to have that being broken up, you can go and do that. In the pattern, you can then go and select the pattern. And there's so much stuff that you can play with. I find this a really cool part of the creative process. I might not use a pattern overlay, just know that it's there. And I might also go and uh, change my mind about the the amount of orange. I might just go and blend a little bit of orange in here just so that she separates from the background a little bit. So on top of that, you can now go and blend this in more or less and see what effect you like. Let me show you another cool thing of what we can do to really go to town on this background. Let me import an image now that I have included in this set. It's something very simple that I've drawn out in Clip Studio Paint. Very good image manipulation program as well. Very good alternative to Photoshop. Has some of the same principles. It's compatible with Photoshop files, but it's more designed for drawing comic artwork. There's quite a few others. There's actually also, uh, while we're on the topic of what else to use if you don't want to use Photoshop, what alternatives do we have? There's uh, there's that uh, Clip Studio Paint that used to be called Manga Studio. There's also Paint Shop Pro. That's a Corel product. That is quite nice. You can pick that up on sale very often. And then there's also the open source GIMP. But I'm, you know, it, it, that's very different than than all these programs. So it is free though. So I'm going to go into my new project. And there it is. This is called Burst here. And if I place that image, then Photoshop is going to put it right in the center and it lets me now move it somewhere. So this isn't locked in. If I left click and drag this, it'll go and, you know, move itself here. I might just go and put that slightly higher behind her, maybe behind her neck, something like that. And then I'll go and left click and drag this to make it larger. If you wanted to scale this from the center rather than through the corner, hold Alt. And then that shall happen. Once you're happy with the size, something like this maybe. You do final positioning and just hit enter to lock that in. Now this looks a little bit um, scary right now. And it's also overlaying with the outline here. So I'm going to left click and drag that underneath the outline. The outline is kind of part of the character. So I'd like to leave that alone and put it above the background here. Notice that it is already a smart object. So it already has this little icon here. That means the embedded image is now a smart object and I could add an effect to this as I see fit. So maybe I don't want this to be uh, quite so sharp. Maybe I like to just subtly blend that in and also blur that out a little bit. I can do that, head over to filter blur and maybe a little bit of Gaussian blur might be good here but feel free to try any of the others here like motion blur radial blur they're all very interesting effects here so I'm, I'm just going to stick with Gaussian blur now and make it yeah make it something like this it's really the shape is almost no longer noticeable there's just something subtle going in there hit OK. You can also change this value later since this is a smart object. And now we can go and use the same technique as I've shown you before. So I can go and either drop down the opacity here or I can go and blend this in with something else that might look nice. I might stick to you know, like this one here, for example, overlay, overlay or soft light. They're kind of nice to blend things in while not messing around with the color too much. I'm thinking maybe overlay here was quite nice, but there's also other things like difference and stuff that'll, you know, make it darker or change the color. So, you know, play around with these things. I'm thinking overlay is kind of nice because that gives that little tone and tone thing there. And it looks like we've now broken up the background to something that is no longer flat and looks a little bit more interesting than it did before. The cool thing about this creative process is that you see what works and what doesn't work. So I'm thinking here, even though I like the effect in principle, I don't think it works well with my render at all. So I'm going to go and change this back from overlay to normal. And I'll go and right click on this burst 
and add another blending option. I'm going to get rid of the white and go and turn it into something else that might match the picture a little bit better. So let me do that with perhaps another color overlay here. And we've selected orange before, that might work, but if it doesn't, double click this and pick something else. Does, does green work from her earrings here? Eh, I'm not sure. Does maybe this blue work here? That could work. Or just something like the lighter blue here, maybe that'll work. That might work. That might work. Play around with this. To get the live preview, you have to pick a color and then let go of the mouse, by the way. And then just see what what might work and maybe maybe just something like this that might that might work hit okay and see what you want to do with the opacity how much or how little of that color you want to blend in and it looks like she's like a manga star now but again this is all non-destructive so if i'm thinking hey this this could be larger so that more of the background will be exposed by this you can just go use the move tool here and then alt scroll the mouse wheel to give yourself a little bit more room and then left click and then you can rotate it or you can go left click and drag hold alt to make it larger and do maybe something like this i don't know what that's going to look like so while you do this the blur effect is not applied so you're seeing this essentially as it looks as if the effect hadn't been applied and then when you hit enter then photoshop and goes and recalculates this effect so there we go now she she looks more like a manga star that comes out of an explosion like a proper pop idol type thing and you can blend in more or less of this and maybe now i'm thinking that the orange outline that i've given her was a little bit too strong so i'll go and turn that down or blend that in even more. You get the picture. You can do whatever your render requires. I might go and tidy this up and put the burst above the background. Let's do that. Open the background group. Left click and drag the burst layer into like onto the top of the background layer. And now this means that if we wanted to have the whole background to be a little bit darker, we can just go and apply a correction layer like we've already seen before. That also applies to groups. So with the group selected here, even with the group closed, I can head over to the yin yang icon and use maybe brightness and contrast. And that now goes on top of the group and it allows me to adjust whatever the background looks like. So let's go and do that. Maybe increase the contrast a bit see what that looks like maybe turn down the pad the brightness a little bit so make that a bit darker so that she stands out a little bit doing so means we may have to go and readjust other parts of the adjustments that we've already made that's perfectly fine like i'm now thinking perhaps my character itself could do with a bit of color correction and that's another little trick that i wanted to quickly show you which has also got to do with correction layers so we've applied this correction layer on top of our background conversely whatever change i make applies to the background if i had put this on top of my layer stack like so left click and drag until the blue line kind of snaps into place then everything would be adjusted so anything underneath it so if i go and use the brightness to increase or decrease this my character as well as my background is affected and i might not want that let me go and click Control z to undo the placement and pop that correction layer back into place so that this is responsible for the background turn it down like something like this if i now wanted to give my character additional color correction that does not affect the background we can use something called a clipping layer and that works something like this so you first of all you go and create another correction layer i'm going to select the top group here just so that it gets created in the correct place and just for demonstration purposes i'll use the brightness and the contrast that pops itself on the top of the layer stack and once again, if I go and change this, everything underneath it will be affected. Control Z to undo that. If I go and hover over this gap between the layer and what comes next, I can tell Photoshop, hey, clip it down to this layer. So by holding Alt, 
I can see that this little square comes up. So I'm not holding Alt now and nothing happens. If I hold down Alt while I hover, then this little arrow with the square comes up. And that means if I now left click, it'll go and apply this now as a clipping layer. So that means this effect is only applied to whatever's directly underneath it. Could be a single layer or could be a group. In our case, it's the whole characters group here. So as a result, I can now go and make an adjustment that only affects whatever is inside the group. And that is kind of exactly what I want. Maybe she needs a little bit more contrast here. Maybe she needs to be a bit lighter. I don't want to burn her out here, but you get the picture. This is now an adjustment that happens only to the character and not to the background. So without that clipping layer, if I wanted to get rid of that, once again, hold Alt and then hover over to the little gap and then the arrow is crossed out. When you left click now, the clipping is removed and my Correction would apply to the whole stack again. Control Z. So Alt, hover in between where you want that to appear and then left click and then that is that correction layer clipped only to whatever's un directly underneath it. So I'm going to call this one. This is the original one that I've shown you here. And this is the one that I've literally just created from scratch here. This one also has a vignette on the top here. This one does not. I'm going to go and save this as curl me two, so that you get to see both versions and you can play around with it and recreate this from scratch because once you've done it a couple of times, it's really, really fun tool in your creative arsenal to play with. Uh, curl me two. I'll say that, save. And in the next episode, I want to quickly talk about how we actually export images out of Photoshop and also how to do a little bit of basic color correction if we wanted our image to be a little bluer, a little more orange and all that. So I'm going to explain that in the next episode. Stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm.